Coming up next on the Passion Start podcast. How can we do better in the future? We can do better in the future by learning from this and using it. And those are the successful companies. At the end of the day, you shouldn't be afraid of failing and you shouldn't punish your employees or people for failing if it didn't happen because of laziness. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become Passion struck. I am so honored and ecstatic today to have Dr. Uri Ganesi on the Passion Struck podcast. Welcome, Uri. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, I wanted to start off the interview by congratulating you on the launch of your new amazing book called Mixed Signals How Incentives Really Work. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's an exciting journey. Well, I absolutely loved it. And as we discussed prior to the interview, I love the illustrations that are throughout it. And I thought they did such a great job in helping complement your different chapters. So well done. Thank you. I think that it's great to have a visual because we read and it's hard to grab our attention. And once you have something like this, you have a cartoon that illustrates the point. I think that helps me remember it. And I hope it will also help the readers remember the takeaways in a fun way. I wanted to start out with, I have spent a lot of time interviewing many behavioral scientists on the podcast, and much of the study of behavioral economics started in lab environments. But as I researched you, you specialize in field experiments. And I was hoping that you could explain the difference between the two, how they complement each other, and perhaps also discuss what your role is with the Behavior Change for Good initiative. Experiments is one tool. It's a tool that we're using. It used to be the group when I did my PhD in the late 90s, when I received it, I was called an experimental economist because we identified ourselves with the tool. But at the same time, there was another group that called themselves behavioral economists, and I think that they were right. And now very few people call themselves experimental economists. We call ourselves behavioral economists because we use other tools. So surveys, real data, theory, many ways in which you can study the behavior of people. And experiments are just one tool that we do. I think that it was a useful thing to do back in the 70s and 80s when they started because they wanted to distinguish themselves from other ways that economists did. And that was a very revolutionary thing to do at the time. But now we are mature enough to say, look, we are interested in behavioral economics. And it's actually funny because when I talk with normal people, not economists, and I tell them behavioral economists, they ask me, are there any other kinds of economists? And they think that they are right. So if you look back enough, you'll see. So Adam Smith would have been considered a behavioral economist. Today. And all the people up to basically the revolution that happened after the Second World War with neoclassical economics, I think were behavioral economists. They understood that we care about the behavior of people. That's what we care about. And we can approach it with different tools. We can approach it with experiments or with real data or with theory or whatever we want. But at the end of the day, we care about how people behave. Okay. And before we dive headfirst into incentives, I wanted to jump to another topic because I found a great research paper that you did in 2021. You co-wrote it, but it's about how individuals make time money trade-offs in labor context. And in the paper, they're either asked to work to earn money or to pay money to avoid work. Can you tell us about the results from the study? Yes. Two marketing people here, Gal and Wendy, two good friends. One of them is a graduate student. I think that every good behavioral study that I did starts with the real life observation. So I can tell you about myself that I do stuff at the house, say at the garden or fixing my deck or things like that, even when I don't enjoy them, just to avoid paying for it. 
But then you ask yourself, would you do the same to go and work on the deck or the garden of your neighbor? Of course not, right? I wouldn't do it to be, in order to be paid. So imagine that I can fix something for $200. Well, I'll rather do it myself. But I would never go and do the work for, some, for my neighbor, right? Something that is called mental accounting in economics that is very, very clear in this case that I'm willing to work in order to avoid paying money, but I'm not going to do the same work for someone else in order to earn the money. So it's kind of a weird thing that I think many of us have, right? So many of us are reluctant to hire people to fix stuff, despite of the fact that it's much more efficient. I can do consulting and earn more money than a gardener, right? A gardener earns $15 an hour, $20 an hour. I earn more if I do consulting, but yet I feel bad when I spend the money this way. So that was our starting point. And then we started to, to look at different aspects of it. And the paper that you mentioned, basically, we said, look, say that we need you to work for us for 10 hours. How much money do we have to pay? People said $100. They calculated $10 an hour. And they said, if you want us to work for you for 10 hours, it will cost you $100. Then we asked a different group of people, told them, look, we have $100 to spend. How many hours are you willing to work for it? And then people said, well, three or four hours which doesn't make sense, right? Because now they are saying the value of an hour of work for us is $25 instead of $10. So we found that if we give you the number of hours, you basically multiply your hourly wage by this and we get quite a flat line. So we ask you for one hour, you say $10, five hours, you say $50, 10 hours, $100. That was, on the other end, when we ask you how much, if we pay $10, how much are you willing to work for us? You'll say one hour. So that's still the same. But if we ask you five hours, already say only three hours, which implies that your hourly wage becomes much higher. We ask you for hundred dollars, how much are you willing to work for us? You say much less than the 10 hours that, that otherwise. And I think that it's interesting. We don't really know how to trade time and money in a sensible way. I think it is because as you wrote in the article, the thing about time is you can't go back and recoup it. So it is interesting how people value the two and which one they put their preference on. So right. I just so thought, this, yeah. yeah. You have this go time ahead. is money. Well, it's not, right? You cannot go to the ATM. Like you said, you can go to the ATM and redraw some time. And you know, time is, in a sense, the great equalizer. The richest people in the world don't have more money than I do. More, sorry, they, have, they do have much more money than I do. They don't have more time than I do. Right? So time is kind of fixed. You can take it with you. You cannot save it. It's really fundamentally different. And I think that the psychology of it is very different because of that. Well, I wanted to use this topic to introduce incentives because if you look across all the countries in the world, the United States is in the bottom three of work-life balance. And you're seeing now all this employee disengagement because I think a big thing about it is even when you do have PTO or vacation, many Americans do not take it. And so I think now companies are trying to force them to take it, but it doesn't seem as though the incentives that they're using are paying off. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this. That's actually a surprising question to start the discussion of incentives, and I really like it, right? Because you're saying maybe we're getting too much incentives to work in the US and relative to other places. So in Germany, for example, when you get unemployment benefits, you are forced to take vacation from unemployment in order to keep getting your unemployment. So you really have to go on vacation. So stop looking for work. In the US, we do work a lot. My daughter is a software engineer, and she gets I think 10 days a year or something like that as vacation, which is very little. And I think that many people, like you mentioned, during COVID really said, well, maybe they're recalculating, especially the younger people recalculating. Maybe we don't want to do this. But I don't know where it's going to end. It's, it's an interesting dynamic that is still going on, and it's not clear where it's going to end. But it's clear that something about the incentive structure should change in the sense that, let me give you one example that, that I care about. If you look at investment banking, say, or law firms, people work over their 60, 70, 80 hours a week. And that doesn't make any sense because no one is really effective after 10 hours a day, especially when you need to use your brain. 
after 15 hours, your marginal value is negative. You're going to make bad decisions, bad choices. And I think that in many of these cases, the norm became to work so hard. If you know that you're going to be there for 12, 15 hours, you're going to take more coffee breaks. You're going to check your social media. You're going to do some other stuff. You, you cannot just concentrate. I think that it would have been much better if you knew that you have eight hours a day to work. And when you're at work, you actually work. The incentives should be such that it's like that. So if I would have opened a new investment banking or financial advisor company, I would say, look, you're allowed to work only eight hours a day. That way, I think that I could have attracted better people that are willing to work these eight hours a day and then go home and stop working. I think that would have been great, but that's not the norm now. And I think that we all suffer from it. Yes, and the incentives that we've been teaching our children are definitely causing a lot of this. As I found out from a recent interview I did with Robert Waldinger, who leads the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And in 2007, they surveyed a large amount of millennials and asked them what the number one factor in their happiness would be. And they said it was getting rich. Second, it was getting famous. And they did the study a decade later and came back with almost the same result. And so obviously that's coming from somewhere and how they believe they should be leading their lives. Yeah, someone already said that youth is wasted on young people. So I, my friend told me a nice story. How do you know that you get older if your friends stop complaining about money and start complaining about health? So when you get older, you see it more about the balance in life. That it's not just about getting richer. But I think that to a great extent, that's a difference between the US and you mentioned Spain, for example. I think that in Spain, you'll get less of this. If you'll survey the people in Spain, there is probably the data is probably out there. You'll get less of what would make you happy. Less would be defined in terms of getting a good job, earning lots of money and things like that. And it would be more at life balance. Yes. And it's interesting, the American perspective of the Spaniards was that they were lazy. But I, I wonder if you look 20 years down the road, who's happier between the two groups and who suffers more burnout? Well, I'm going to get off of this. I just thought it was a fun conversation to maybe introduce the topic of incentives. But in the book, you begin by describing a situation, speaking of your kids, that I think many of us are victims of. We go to a movie, or in your case, a theme park like Disney, or an other event where there's a free entry based on your kid's age, and you end up telling a white lie about their age to gain free entry. My question for you is, what can we learn about how incentives send signals from that example? So the story is that my son turned three, and that's a great age because that's when they start to communicate and you can talk with them. And when they start communicating, they also start lying. That's what people do. That's what kids do. And then as a good parent, we told them that good, only bad people lie, so you shouldn't lie. That was fine. Unfortunately, my son is not stupid. So we went to Disney World and just after he turned three, and like you said, the cashier tells us, under three-year-old, it's free, and over, it's, I think, if I remember correctly, it was $117. And I immediately said, well, he's almost three, which is true because he's almost three, just from the wrong side, right, of the, of the three. We, she smiled, we paid, we, I paid for myself, and we went in. And then half an hour later, my son pulled my shirt and asked me, Daddy, you told me that only bad people lie and you just lied. What's the story over here? And that's, uh, that really summarizes the, what the book is about. The book is about the different signals that we say. So I can tell my son, one signal is telling my son, look, being honest is important. Good people tell the truth, bad people lie. That's a very strong story that you try to, to tell your son and send a signal. But then when you get incentives, in my case, it was $117, you get incentives to lie and you lie. That sends a very different signal to my son. That's the title, Mixed Signals, because on the one end, they tell him what he should do. On the other end, is he observes what I do in the presence of incentives. And almost every incentive that you can think of actually sends a signal. Say that I'm working for you. I'm your employee. I want to be a good worker. All else equal, most of us want to be good workers, right? But we don't always know what it is. And you can tell me stories about 
say that I would work for you in fact checking. You tell me it's really important for me that you'll get it right, that you'll get only the facts in my book and whatever. But then you'll incentivize me to finish it fast. What kind of message am I going to get from this? What's the signal that I'm getting? Do you care about quality or do you care about me being fast? And of course, I'll react to the incentives. Like my son understood that I reacted to the incentives in the entrance to Disney World, you, you should expect me to actually be fast and the quality might be lower because I'll really try to be fast. First of all, because that's the way I will make more money. But even deeper than that, I'm not really sure that you really care about quality if you're paying me for quantity. So that's the risk of this. That's what my son actually learned. So a few minutes later, we got to another attraction, which was four or above, four year or above. And my son said, without hesitation, I'm just over four. So he didn't have any problem to learn from me what, what you should do when it suits you. <laughs> well, the flip side of that is if you're Disney and you know that people are doing this, I think there's a common way that many of us would approach the situation if we were Disney. The easiest way to do it would be to require people to bring some form of identification. Right. That can yeah. cause its own difficulties. So how would the solution change based on the use of signal? So like you said, I think see, Disney can ask me to bring birth certificate if I want to get the discount, but that's not the way you do in this one big happy family. You go there, it's the happiest place in the world and everyone should be happy. You should trust me. If I tell you, you should trust me. And by the way, I'm not unique. If you look at Google Analytics, you see that billions of people are asking this question with a B, not, I'm not exaggerating, right? Asking for ID would work, but that's not the way you go. So if you think about the solution, a behavioral economics kind of behavioral science kind of solution to this, Disney can actually ask that the kid will say their age, right? I could have trained my son, look, Ron, we're going to get there. Now you should lie. I could have said it, but that's a very strong already violation of the norm. I don't think that I would have done it for $117. So I really think that Disney could use this in terms of signaling because the, see, Disney should understand that I'll be less likely to send a signal to my son that he should lie when he gets to the line. So that could be a behavioral solution for them. Just say we need the child to tell us how old they are. Okay. And staying on this theme of lies, you also wrote a paper with Marta Sara Garcia to study the ability to detect lies, and you developed a new paradigm from your work. What did you both determine? So the, we tried to look at whether people are good at detecting lies in videos. So we had people recording videos in which they either told the truth or lie. And then we showed these videos to people and tried to see whether people are good at detecting whether the people are saying truth or not. Turns out that people are really bad at detecting lies. So they think they make what we call type one and type two errors. They believe stuff that they shouldn't and they don't believe stuff that they should. So the first finding is that people are just really bad at detecting lies and that's consistent with other findings in the literature. Interestingly, people are really overconfident about their ability to detect lies. So the fact that we are bad, I teach negotiation over here and I talk with my students, I tell them that they shouldn't lie in negotiation, but they shouldn't be naive. Other people will lie to them. And that they're going to be very bad at detecting lies, but they're also going to be very overconfident about their ability to distinguish between a lie and truth. And that's very dangerous when you negotiate, for example, or when you just try to figure out what people do, that you make this mistake of thinking that you are really good at it. So I can tell you that I study lies for 15 years now, maybe even a bit more, and I'm not better at detecting lies than anyone else. That's something that I learned about myself. So when I watch these videos, if I don't know what happens, I'm not good at detecting whether it's true or false. What I did learn and what is important to learn is that I'm really bad at it. And that's that in itself is important, right? If you're not overconfident, you know that you're not just not that good at, at detecting this. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. And it makes me think of the topic of gambling, where you're probably playing against people at a poker table who are trying to lie to you in one way or another. And it was interesting. I had Annie Duke on the podcast, and I asked her, being a professional poker player, what di differentiates a professional from a novice? And her answer was pretty interesting is she said, we end up holding about 
more times than a novice would. There are lots of, uh, I think that poker, I enjoy playing poker. And poker is a risky game because the feedback that you get is noisy. If I play chess against someone who is better than me, I will lose every game. I'm not a good chess player, I will lose every game. When you play poker, and I'm not a great poker player, I play twice a year, I enjoy it, I, sometimes I get lucky. Right? So I can play against the best player in the world. Within an hour, I can do better than that player. Because it's noisy, I might just get really lucky. I can make stupid decisions, which I do because, for example, I'm not patient enough, right? So I play too many hands. And then you can get lucky. I can chase stuff and I can get lucky. So it's learning is, is really harder, right? So when you think about the incentives, the incentives push you to understand that in chess, when, they, when the incentives are clear in chess that I just, I shouldn't play against someone who's much better than me. I will lose all the time. With poker, the, sometimes you win, you remember this win. And mo mostly we say that we remember losses more than, than wins. But I think that in poker, at least for me, I remember the wins more than the losses. Right? Because I kind of I expect to lose some money. And when I win, it's an amazing feeling. And we get the notion that we are much better than we are. And that relates to the line that you said, that we are overconfident about our ability. I'm not overconfident about my ability to play chess. I'm definitely overconfident about my ability to play poker. Well, I think I could say the same thing about golf that you said about handling, because I could go out there and shoot 100 plus, but if I had one or two good shots, that's what you seem to remember as your takeaway and not how bad you shot on the other ones. Well, I think that's great. That's yeah. interesting, right? Because we do talk about loss aversion and how the, we remember the bad stuff. But maybe when it comes to hobbies, for example, we remember the good stuff. It's interesting. Well, it, it is interesting. I interviewed this performance psychologist, Nate Zinzer, who has been teaching at West Point for 20, 25 years. And he has a book about confidence. And he said that if you look at the best athletes, Kirby Bucket, Eli Manning, who he coached, Olympic bobsledding athletes, what he teaches them to do is to not focus on the number of times they struck out, focus on the number of hits you had and the mechanics that caused you to have that success, not the failure. It's a really interesting, interesting. way to, to think about things. Yeah. Speaking of gambling, Often when we're playing, there's a conflict between what a person might be saying to you and the signals that their body are giving off, which are telling a different story. And there's often the same thing when it comes to incentives. And my question is, why is there often a conflict between what we say and what our incentives signal? So there are, in the book, I talk about few aspects of this. One of them I mentioned, the quantity versus quality. So think about my profession. I'm a professor. I get basically being good at my job would mean publishing good paper, lots of good papers. But it has a quantity and a quality measure. Imagine that my dean would come and say, for every paper that you publish, I'll give you a bonus. That would be incentive for quantity. Right? So as a result, I'll publish many papers. If she'll tell me I'll pay you for quality, then I'll try to concentrate on only the top journals and publish over there. The worst is when she'll come and tell me, you should focus on quality, but then give me incentives for quantity. So very often we see this tension between quantity and quality. Another one is between team and individual incentives. So I can tell you, look, we really care about teamwork. You need to work together with others, cooperate with them. It's really important. But then I give you individual incentives because it's very easy to, to measure and it's very easy to keep. Sometimes it's better to have people that you care really only about the best performer and you should attract the best people and you should give individual incentives. That's great. It's not a mistake. Sometimes you care about the team. You should give incentives to the team. What you shouldn't do is say, I care about the team, but then give individual incentives, right? You need to be consistent because the incentives that you give send a message that people take to heart. You can leave them confused or just leave them following something that you don't want. Another one, think about politicians, uh, short run and long run, or CEOs or coaches, if you want. We all say that we care about the long run, 
right, for politician, the governor of California, I, wa I want him to care about the long run with public transportation. Imagine that he decides to invest in, in train. That project will be ready in 20 years. He'll have to put a lot of resource, resources today, which means that he will not be able to put resources in other stuff that people will see. And the outcome will be 20 years from now. If he's lucky, he'll still be alive, but he definitely won't be re-elected with such position. There is a nice uh, quote saying that uh, from a politician says, we all know what we need to do, but we don't know how to get elected based on this, right? So the, the, there is a tension between the short run and the long run. So if you hire a coach and you tell the coach, look, we want the team to be successful this season, we care about, or maybe we are willing to suffer this season in order to train the young people, give them experience and build up the team. But then if the team loses, you fire them. That's the wrong incentives to give. So you need to make sure that if you do care about the long run, which in many cases you should, don't judge people at the end of the quarter or after a few games or whatever it is, right? So in some cases, you don't have any other choice with the election. I like the fact that uh, we live in a democracy in which every four years we get a chance to say what's our opinions about, about the leader. I'm saying that it's not a perfect system. Maybe one of the major problems with it is that the elected politician cannot think about the long run. But with, with companies, we should be, we have more freedom, right? We can appoint someone, we can tell that person, look, you're in charge, you need to take this team or you need to take this company. We care about the long term, define what the long term is. We'll give you a window of two years in which we'll make sure that you're not taking vacation, taking the private jet and going to, to the Caribbeans every week. But as long as we see that you're making the effort will give you a chance. That's going to be much better than telling them, okay, we care about the long run, but we're going to evaluate you at the end of the court. Yeah, and I have a great personal example of this. When I was recruited to join Dell, Michael had told me that what he wanted to bring to the organization was large scale transformation. And the only way that you're going to do that is to really make long-term decisions about the strategy of the company. But what I found out when I got there was that although they talked about long-term goals, all the reward systems that the company had in place were based on quarterly results. In fact, I've never been with a company where so many long-term initiatives where we were spending tens of millions of dollars on them were cut because they were not producing immediate results. To make it even worse, one of the biggest award systems that they had was, at that time, there were five different presidents, and Michael would have them all compete on a quarterly basis, and one of them would get this huge trophy. And then at the end of the year, the person who had the most trophies would, of course, get rewarded the most money, and the person who was number five would most likely get fired. Right, and right, right. so that's perfect example, yeah. right? So they should read my book. And yes. I think that's exactly the point. You cannot expect someone that knows that he or she will be evaluated at the end of the quarter to actually think about the long run. So Michael can tell them whatever he wants. That's not what they're going to do. It can also get them to do unethical things. It could be from just sabotaging the other presidents, like you said that five presidents, we need to get, uh, we need to be the best. One way is to be better myself. Another way is to get the other one to perform less well. I think that that's a perfect example of what you said. Well, I wanted to jump to shaping incentives. And one of the things that you brought up in the book, and as I was reading it, I was thinking about my dog Bentley and how I incentivize him, especially when he was younger to carry out the behaviors that I wanted. But what you say is all animals, not just humans, react to incentives. But while that's the case, why is there a big difference when it comes to shaping incentives between animals and humans? So Bentley probably reacts to incentives just like I do. He smells the food, he's happy, right? And he knows that he'll get a treat, he's happy. And we all are, and all animals are. So yeah, the main difference, so we all react to incentives, but the main difference, the big difference is that Bentley doesn't design incentives for other dogs in, he lives in Florida, he doesn't design incentives for dogs in New York. That's only human are doing this, only human are designing incentives for others. The economy is based on incentives that are designed by people. The great example that's 
quite famous at the end of the Soviet era in the 80s, an economist from Moscow came to London and he met a famous economist in London and said, can you please introduce me to the person who's in charge of bread distribution in London? Because I come from Moscow and we want to learn how to do it better. It doesn't work that well in Moscow. And the British economist didn't know how to answer this. There is no, there isn't a guy in charge of bread distribution in London, right? There is, there are, there are incentives. So the farmer that wakes up early and goes and work in the field, works hard, and then the truck driver, then the baker, the, all this chain are doing it because they have incentives to do this. They need to pay rent. They need to feed their families. Those are all incentive structures that are out there. And we designed them. So market is basically an incentive structure. And there are many other examples of that. We design incentives. Animals, Bentley doesn't design incentives. We do. We all do, right? You design incentive for Bentley. Maybe Bentley designs incentive for you, by the way. So if you don't behave like he wants you to behave, he can probably react to this. But he doesn't, he would never be able to design incentives for me. I'm too far away from him. And people can do that. Well, I'm sure in his own head, he wishes he could develop an incentive to get more cats to come by the yard so he could chase them. Well, one of... What does he do with them if he catches one? They're usually too fast. I've never seen him catch one. But he doesn't chase anything but cats. It's so interesting. I think it's more curiosity than anything for him. And he likes their smell. He He knows who chased them. He doesn't know why. Yes, (laughs) exactly. Well, that leads me to a topic that I didn't really know too much about before I read your book, and that was the difference between social signaling and self-signaling. And I was hoping for the listeners who might be like me and didn't understand the difference, what's the difference between the two and what happens when incentives are added to the mix? So social signaling would be me trying to impress you by actions that I do or choices that I make or just talking with you, I can try and impress you. That's social signaling. Self-signaling is me trying to figure out for myself what kind of a person I am. So let me give you an example from the book. Say that we both live in warm places. Imagine that we would live in Minnesota. That's a a better location for the story, better setup for the story. Imagine that you live in a cold place. You see your neighbor in the morning walking with a large bag filled with, say, 100 soda cans to the recycle center. You probably say, wow, she's a great person. She really cares about the environment. So she's sending you a signal that she cares about the environment, that she's a good person. And that's the social signaling. She might even feel good about herself and say, well, I'm a good person. I could have thrown them to the trash. That was easy, but I do make the effort. I am a good person. That would be the self signaling. So that's the difference between self and social signaling. How it interacts with incentives Imagine that now you live in a place where you get five cents per soda can that you recycle, like in many places you see. So now, same scenario, you see your your neighbor, she walks to the recycle center in a cold morning with a hundred soda can, and then you say, for $5, she's really cheap, (laughs) right? So the social signaling that she sends is not, oh, I care about the environment, but that she's cheap. You attribute something very different to her actions than you did before. Could also affect the self-signaling. So before that, I did it because I'm a good person. Now I'm doing it for $5. Well, for $5, I'm not going to leave the house and walk on the ice and do that. So we have self-signaling, social signaling, and the interaction with incentives that is, I think, interesting to understand. As a follow-on to that, I thought an interesting thing that you covered in the book was the value of self-signaling from the economics of blood donations. So many people donate blood, we know that, and in the U.S. you are not allowed to get paid for it, and in most places in the world you are not allowed. And there is a discussion in economics starting in the 70s. There was a guy called Titamus, the economist, wrote a book about the difference between the American and the British system at the time. So at the time in the U.S. you got paid for blood donation, and in the U.K. you didn't. And his claim was that in the US, you get drug addicts and to donate blood. And in the UK, you get normal people that care about the world donating blood. And then he talked about the quality of blood that you get because of that diseases that you can have of it. The idea is that when I go to donate blood, I feel good about myself. That's the self-signaling. I really feel good about myself when I do something good like this. 
I might even mention it to my friends at work. I'm sorry I couldn't be here in the morning. I went to donate blood. That would be the social signal. And that's, that's, uh, that's fine. People do it all the time. Now, again, like the story with the solar can, imagine that I would give you $50 for doing this. Well, you might get my daughter to do it. She is a student. She needs the money. She might go and do it for $50. But I won't, wouldn't do it for $50. So I would say, well, for $50, it's not worth it. I, it would change, like with the solar can, it would change the meaning of what I'm doing from I'm a good guy to I'm doing it for $50. So monetary incentives would be bad. But you can think about other kinds of incentives that you can give. For example, you can give me a pen or a coffee mug with the logo of the blood bank then that's an incentive, right? And it also reinforces both signals. So now when I, at work, I come to the meeting with the coffee mug saying blood bank, everyone knows that I'm a nice guy, that I donated blood. So I get this, the value of social signaling. I might even feel good every morning when I drink coffee from this to be reminded how good of a person I am. The monetary incentive in this case would crowd out the social and self signaling but the mug can actually, the coffee mug can actually reinforce these two signals. So that's why the, what, how you pay is also very important. Yeah, it's interesting. Another example that I can think of is if you're a Catholic and you think of Palm or Ash Wednesday, those who wear the ashes on their forehead to signify that they actually went to church on that day and were practicing it, it is another, I think, way that you could send a signal. Right. So instead um, of bragging, you don't have to say, oh, I went to service. People can just see, right? Exactly. Right. Well, one of my favorite television shows has always been Seinfeld. It was interesting that you brought Seinfeld up in the book. And what I wanted to ask is, what did Seinfeld teach us about ways to inform others about values, your abilities, and preferences? Oh, so I think that Seinfeld, Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld are the best psychologists I know. So the, the observations they have, one of the nicest one I like is about the must lie situation. So Elaine and Jerry have to go and see the baby, you have to see the baby, you have to see the baby, then they see the baby. And the baby is like the ugliest baby they've ever seen. They really, you could see that they are shocked when they see it. And then they go outside and to catch some hair, hair and then they say the interesting part is that the parents will never know how ugly their baby is because no one is going to tell them that the baby is ugly. That's what they call the must lie situation. The example that really relates to incentive is gifts. So Jerry needs to buy uh, Elaine a gift. She has a birthday. And if you think about it, gifts are really funny. So before holidays, you buy gifts to your friends or to your family. People waste huge amounts of time and money, and they don't get exactly what the other person wants. It's much better to give from an economic perspective, not from a psychological perspective that we'll get to in a second. It's much better to just give you a gift card or just give you cash, right? And that's what, what Jerry is actually doing. He, he decides to give Elaine, I think it was $182 cash for her birthday. So he gives her the envelope wrapped very nicely and she's very excited. Then she opens it and she screams at him, what are you, my uncle? What are you giving me cash? And, that, and then Kramer comes in and he gives her something much cheaper, a bench that costs much less. And she's very happy because the signal that you send when you give cash is, look, I didn't want to waste time on you. I didn't really care. I found the simplest way of rewarding you. Whereas if you buy a gift, you say, look, I thought about what are your preferences? What can I get you? I went to the store, I made some effort. So you are more important to me. You send a signal with, the, with what you give. If you are just an economist, you would say, well, cash, that's it. If you understand the psychology of signals, you would say, yeah, a gift might be a much better way of doing that. Okay, and I'm gonna jump to part two of the books where you go into mixed signals and I'm gonna just talk about a couple of them. We've already brought up encouraging long-term goals, but incentivizing short-term success. Some of the other common ones are encouraging teamwork, but incentivizing individual success. This one I love, inspiring innovation and risk-taking, but punishing failure. And I think I wanted to stick to that one because I have seen that again and again in my career, especially being in technology where 
people want this innovation, but they don't want the fail fast, fail often consequences that are going to come from it. But in the book, you cover a number of companies who've succeeded with doing it, but you also talk about some companies like Blockbuster, we could also say Kodak and Sears, who failed to do it. And my question for you is, what is the cost of a company for not innovating? It's a great example where I can tell you, look, be creative, try new stuff. And then you know that if you fail, I'll fire you or I'll punish you. I won't give you the bonus. And a great example where you will not get creativity. And the example that you gave, so think about Blockbuster in the 90s. We are the most successful company in the world. If you read the history of how Netflix started, basically because of late fees, right? So Blockbuster, for the young listener that don't remember it, Blockbuster was not that expensive unless you were too late in bringing back the DVD at the time. And then they charged you ridiculous amounts of money that were extremely annoying to get. And what they didn't understand is that the world is changing. Same is true for Kodak and all the examples that, that you mentioned. Many companies are doing well and are missing creativity. When I ask about consulting, I always prefer to consult with a successful company than with a company in distress because the company that doesn't do well is already thinking and trying the best they can, reevaluating everything. The successful companies are the one that actually can benefit much more from someone looking deep into what they're doing and telling them. So if someone in the 90s would have told Blockbuster, look, you're doing well, but, so you're a monopoly now, but the world is changing. It's not always going to be physical stores. You're annoying your uh, customers. That's a mistake. You need to do something. Wake up before it's too late. That would have been a, a great thing. And then they should have played with stuff and see what works and what doesn't. To understand what works, you need to think about what doesn't. For my little world, I run experiments. We started with this. I run experiments. Very often I make mistakes. I have intuition, I run the experiment, people don't behave the, thing, the way I thought they are. I try to learn from this. What was wrong with my intuition? What did I do? I don't get mad at the people and say I should change the people. But I understand that my intuition was wrong and maybe I shouldn't pursue this experiment because it doesn't work. Or maybe I should actually learn something much more interesting that is counterintuitive that can actually teach me about this. But I try something. If it doesn't work, it's your fault. You came up with a suggestion. We tried it. It didn't work. It's your fault. I'm going to be upset at you. And that means that I'll fire you. Don't want to give you a promotion or bonus. That's the wrong way to go. You need to analyze it. You need to do the three things that are important to do when you debrief something like this is look what happened. Why did it happen? And how can you do better in the future? So if when you look at what happened, clearly it didn't work why it happened, you can think, oh, it didn't happen because you didn't do your job. You didn't put enough effort, then you should be punished. But if I look at why it happened, well, we had the wrong mental image of what people are doing, how people are going to react, then you should say, okay, how can we do better in the future? We can do better in the future by learning from this and using it. And those are the successful companies. At the end of the day, you shouldn't be afraid of failing and you shouldn't punish your employees or people for failing if it didn't happen because of laziness. Yeah, and I'll just bring up a great example of this. I recently released an episode with the Home Depot co-founder, Bernie Marcus, and I asked him what the secret of the success was while he was leading the company. And he said, a lot of companies, they celebrate the quarters and they talk about all the successes. And he said, I looked at it completely different. I feel like you get complacent when that happens. So whenever we had a successful quarter, I challenged people even more and gave them incentives on finding what we were doing incorrectly or inefficiently that we could put more focus on. And he said that constant state of incentivizing people by trying to look for failures ended up leading to greater and greater success. Smart guy. Yes. Well, I'm going to jump to chapter 12 because I had forgotten about this story of Marlon Brando and the Oscar acceptance. And I was hoping you could tell the listeners, if they're not familiar with what happened, what we can learn from it about audience scarcity 
and the status of award givers. So that's, uh, even we are too old for it, I think. Too young <laughs> for it, sorry, it's 50 years ago. Basically, this chapter talks about awards. How should we evaluate awards? So there are many parameters that go into this. If, if you give the best employee award once a day or once a week, it's going to be less valuable than if you give it once a month or once a year. So think about the Oscars, right? It's valuable because it's very hard and because you do it only once a year. If it was a weekly Oscar ceremony, people would not give it that much attention. And the higher the status of the award, the more important it is. And in many cases, so think about the Nobel Prize in physics. I have no clue why they got it, but I can understand that smart people evaluated them and they had competition with other very smart people. If you got a Nobel Prize in physics, I have all the respect for you without understanding at all what you're doing. Right, so the award could signal that person is really important. It's also important who gives it. So Nobel, you mentioned, did it because he had bad conscience. He invented dynamite and he understood that he killed lots of people. So he wanted to clear his conscience in a sense. But you can think about who is giving the award. Imagine that uh, about the book, for, for the book. Imagine that I'll get an award. I would care about the relevant people that give it more than the less relevant people. If anything that you can think about, the people that actually give the award is important. And also the recipient. So when you taught with me about this podcast, you told me who you interviewed before. And I was very impressed by that. So the, you get signals about what you're doing by the people that got the award or got the podcast in this case, but the, the set that you compare yourself, the audience, and many, many other aspects. And it's all a very good way to send signals. So the story with Marlon Brando at the time was he was upset with the way Native Americans were represented in movies. So the John Way movies that we all grew up on in which he goes around and killed the bad Indians, he thought that that's a really wrong representation of what happened. That it was a big crime conducted in the American history against Native Americans, and that should be reflected in movies. We're talking about 50 years ago. Today, it would be clear that's something that you should do. But 50 years ago, it wasn't. It was clear there were good guys and bad guys, and the good guys always look the same. The bad guys didn't. He wanted to send a very strong message in the Oscar ceremony when he got the Oscar, which is clearly a, the greatest honor that an actor can get. He didn't go up, he sent a representative, a Native American, that went to receive the award for him and or to reject the award for him, I think, and basically said, look, we are protesting against the representation of Native American in the movie industry. And I think that was a very strong message because he didn't give up something small. He gave up something really important. I think that even being Marlon Brando, it was really important for him winning the Oscars, but he said, look, I want to send a very strong signal and I'm going to do it by not accepting this award. Yes, and I think you bring up some great points. And another guest that I had on the show, your peer, Dolly Chug, wrote a great book about this, A More Just Future this year, about how these biases and how we look at things really depends on if you're the victor or the victim in many cases and how we remember history. And I had two final questions for you, and one of them was, from a company perspective, and one of them was from a personal perspective. And I'll start with the personal one first. And that is, on this podcast, we talk a lot about behavioral change. And what I wanted to ask is, how can incentives help remove barriers to behavioral change? So one of the things that we all struggle with, if you don't have bad habits, you're a very boring person, I think, right? So it's, how do we change our habits? We spend huge amounts of money and, and mental effort on exercising or losing weight, playing less computer games, stop smoking, whatever you want. And the question is, how can we do this? Can incentive help in a sense? So we had experiments in which we paid people to go to the gym for a month and exercise. And then we wanted to see whether the habit will continue after that. And we did see some effect of this. And the idea is that the first time you go to, to exercise, it smells really bad. It's, you don't really know what you need to do. It's kind of, where is it? Where do I park? What do I need to do? And then maybe after a month, you get used to the smell. You maybe you meet some people that you enjoy exercising with. You learn everything. And then you might create some kind of habit that you're going to do in the long run. So we have success with incentivizing other people. And then we thought, you know what? Why can't I incentivize myself to do it? So if you can convince yourself, look, the first time you're going to go and exercise the short-term cost is going to be higher than the short 
short-term benefit. You will not see changes in your body shape. You will not feel better. It's going to be sore. It's going to be bad. Make sure that you commit to go there for a month. And then after a month, you can reevaluate. But first, in terms of incentive, you can give incentive to yourself. You need to do it this way. There is another interesting way of thinking about it by Katie Milkman, Kevin Volpe, and Julia Manson that came up with what they call temptation bundling. So imagine that you want to watch your favorite TV series. You mentioned Seinfeld, but think about something more current. Than... Imagine that you allow yourself to watch it on your iPad only when you exercise. Right? So you basically, you kill two birds with this incentive, self-incentive. You don't indulge yourself too much. You don't spend too much time watching Netflix. And you're really looking forward to, in my case, it's the elliptical machine. I allow myself to watch Netflix only when I'm on the elliptical machine. That's great because hey, I'm looking forward. I want to see what happens in the next episode. I have to go on the elliptical machine and watch it. So this kind of self-incentives are really good for changing your habits. And that's something that you should think about. So incentivizing is definitely not just others. You can also incentivize yourself. Thank you so much again for being here and congratulations on this amazing book. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed it. So. I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Uri Ganesi, and I wanted to thank Uri, the Behavioral Change for Good Initiative, and Yale University Press for the honor and privilege of interviewing him on the show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Strike podcast interview I did with Dr. Will Cole, who is a leading functional medicine doctor. We discuss his brand new book, Gut Feelings, healing the shame-fueled relationship between what you eat and how you feel. But this concept that I talk about with my patients that I talk about in gut feelings of shame inflammation, how do these mental, emotional, spiritual things, if it has to do with chronic stress or trauma, body love or lack of self-compassion, how do these things impact our physical health and how they literally can be stored in our cells? impacting the way that our body methylates, which is our body's ability to regulate inflammation and detox and make neurotransmitters. How is it impacting us? Our body is a cellular library and the thoughts and our words and actions and experiences are the books that fill up that cellular library. The fee for our show is that you share it with family or friends when you find something interesting or useful. If you know someone who is dealing with how to apply incentives, then definitely share today's episode with Uri with them. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. And until next time, live life passion struck. Mm -hmm.